Well, friends, it's a brand new year, 2021. The year 2020 is gone, and so are all of our problems, right? <laughs> if only that were true. Now, this brand new year is the beginning of a brand new series as well, and I'm nothing if not my ever ambitious self. Last year around this time, we were full steam ahead uh, in a series covering uh, the entirety of the book of Matthew. It was going to take uh, a year and a half. We had preachers from all of our different churches at Wizen uh, on board to preach through it. But then, you know, COVID came along and it became unsustainable to continue a series like that, especially once we joined up with uh, the greater Milwaukee pastors. Uh, it was hard to really focus on uh, our series that we were doing. Uh, and so we had to unfortunately leave Matthew by the wayside. By the way, if you haven't checked out that series, you can go to our Wizen uh, YouTube page and check out the Greater Milwaukee Adventist Fellowship Quarantine Collection. Uh, there's videos of over 100 unique speakers there uh, that we filmed uh, over the span of about three months uh, back in 2020. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, uh, give it a look. It's, it's got some really interesting stuff in there. Now, as this new year begins, I'm a little bit more trepidatious. Who knows what this uh, new year holds for us, right? Uh, and so we are doing a series that's uh, still pretty ambitious, but not quite as much as a year and a half. So this is going to be a, a two-month uh, series. Uh, and, and part of that is because, you know, we have to be cautious in these times, right? Uh, who knows exactly what the future holds? Who knows exactly what this year will bring? But truly, there's no such thing as this great reset that people are talking about, right? There's this idea that um, all we have to do is, is uh, forage bravely into this new year and all of our problems will go away. There's this idea that if we elect the right governing bodies and vote the right policies that uh, we can make a perfect world around us. There's this idea that all we have to do is try a little bit harder and we can shape the future uh, and make it the best that it can be. But the problem with this logic is found in an old maxim that you've probably heard, right? Wherever you go, there you are. The problem with this line of thinking is that we inherently have this ability to be and to do good. From the time of the rebellion of the angels um, to the Pharisees of the New Testament, to talking heads of today, there's this feeling that, you know, if we can just be better, if we can just do better, if we can just vote better, uh, we can solve all of our problems. But the truth is, there is no such thing, right? We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, but alone, impossible. So this month and next month, so that's January and February 2021, we're going to be going through the book of Judges. Now this book is in the Bible for one reason, and that's to show the futility of trying to pull good things off without the presence of God. By the way, you can follow along with this series with a study guide that I've prepared. And you can find that at wizensda.org slash judges. Uh, you'll find a 59-day reading guide. Uh, it'll bring you through the end of the book of Joshua, through the book of Judges, and into the beginning of Samuel. And you can follow along with that, and also on that page, uh, as we record these videos, they will accrue there in one place as well. Of course, you can also find uh, these videos uh, as they come out on our Wizen YouTube page and also on our Wizen Facebook page. And friends, I think that this is a needed study, right? Because over the past year, we've all looked out the window and thought, what is going on with the world? It's gone crazy. Whatever side of the political aisle you find yourself on, uh, you've likely looked around and had the thought, what is wrong with people today? And truly, it's been a weird time, and you're not alone if you've thought that. But it's been weird for a long time, right? It was weird before COVID. The world was weird before George Floyd. It's been weird for a long time. And especially in this time of postmodern thought, right, where uh, people don't believe that they are accountable to any actual truth. Everyone has their own version of truth, but no one really assumes this identity that uh, there is an objective truth that we can all adhere to. In light of that, many people never strive for truth and never feel like there's a truth to get back to. And as a result, they simply do what is right in their own eyes and expect everyone else to do the same. I think over this past year, we've really seen this mindset come to a head because if you're watching, you can tell it's not really working for us. But the truth is, 
It didn't work for the Hebrews either. As we dive into our series this month, I'm beginning the series off with uh, this message today entitled, No Man-Made Utopia. Politicians and talking heads in today's world would have you believe that we can create a perfect utopia, that if we just uh, make the right vote, if we just make the right election, if we just try hard enough, we can create heaven here on earth. But the truth is, that is not possible without God. How do I know this? Well, as we dive into the book of Judges, you have to start with the context. And the context begins back in the book of Joshua. These books are really like a part one and part two of the same story. And it helps to understand what's going on in Judges if we go back first through the book of Joshua. Joshua, of course, is Moses' understudy. Back in the book of Numbers, we find him as a young man and a part of this group of 12 spies that's going into the land of Canaan uh, to see what the situation is before God's people claim it as their own. Now, this land is the promised land that God promised to Abraham all the way back in the book of Genesis. That's nearly 400, actually, that's over 400 years uh, before this point in the story. And so this promise is a long time coming. This promised land is a long time coming. Now Joshua and uh, the group of spies goes into the land and they, they check out what's going on. And two of those spies, that would be Joshua and Caleb, come back with the report that yes, God has given us this land and we can truly enter and take it uh, as he has said. But the other 10 scouts bring back a bad report and say, no, we should not attempt this. God will not be with us. It's not safe. Uh, and as a result, the people accept the bad report of the 10 spies over the good report of Joshua and Caleb. Now, as a result, God then tells his people, well, you blew it. I was going to give you this land, but you had no trust. And so let's work on that. And so he tells them to go back into the desert for 40 more years of wandering. Now, at this point in the story, the people actually decide, no, we don't want to wander anymore. We want to go into the promised land. And they try to take it, but they're beat miserably. And they realize that because of their rejection of God, God is no longer with them. And his promise, at least as it stood before, no longer currently stands. Now, that is the recurring theme throughout this narrative, right? God wants to help his people, but the people won't let him. And then they reject him. They try to do things their own way without him. So by the time we get to the beginning of the book of Joshua, Moses has died. And now Joshua is an older man and he has been faithful, right? He's spent lots of time with Moses. He's even spent intimate time with Moses and with God. Uh, and now he is the leader who will bring the people into this promised land. Uh, and he is told by the messenger of the Lord at the beginning of the book, to be strong and courageous, not to fear, uh, and that God will be with him and give him victory in battle. In fact, God will be with the whole army as they go through and as they take this land that he has promised them so long ago. And throughout the book of Joshua, we see this theme of victory and defeat, right? There's a lot of victories, and these victories come when the people are faithful and when they go into battle the way that God asks them to. But when they don't listen to the word of the Lord, and when they decide to go into battle the way they feel like rather than the way God has asked them to, they're faced with defeat. And this happens throughout the book of Judges. Now, there's an important thing to understand about this narrative. As we go into the book of Joshua, you know, of course, the people are people. There's, there's faithfulness and there's faithlessness. But the general rule is faithfulness, right? These are people who have de depended on God through 40 years of wandering in the desert. They've learned to lean on him, right? And so most of the time, they're doing things his way. There's the occasional Achan who goes and takes something he's not supposed to, and that brings calamity on uh, the camp of the Israelites. But, uh, but overall, the people are mostly at Joshua's leadership, um, listening to God and they're faithful to him. But as the book goes on, more and more faithlessness becomes the rule and faithfulness becomes rare. The second half of the book, by the way, is more interested in talking about uh, what was promised to whom and squabbling over that inheritance. By the end of the book, Joshua gives his famous speech to his people, right? He knows that his time with them is short 
And so he exhorts them, right? Those gods that you picked up in Egypt, that you worshiped across the river, those gods, you need to put them away and choose today, who are you going to serve? And if it's going to be those gods, so be it. Uh, but he's exhorting them to choose the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now Joshua, early on in the book of Judges, then passes away, and now he and Moses and the strong leaders uh, are fading fast. Of course, you have Caleb and some who still bring some faithfulness to the table, but the case is that this faithful generation is fading away, and now we're left with a very different type of generation. We read this very telling statement full of foreshadowing of what this book is all about. It says, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. So why do we have the book of Judges, right? It's simple. God wants to bless his people. He's been telling them for hundreds of years now, I want to bless you with this promised land. It's a wonderful utopia where you are going to live and I will be your God. You will be my people. You're going to create this wonderful kingdom uh, where all people will be drawn to you. And you can tell them of my goodness, right? God wants his people uh, to tell the world about him so that they can all come to him, right? And so he leads them out of slavery, right? He leads them through the desert safely. Uh, he, he, he implements the plagues, he implements the pillar of fire, right? Miraculous things. He gives them uh, uh, magical bread that falls from the sky to sustain them in the desert, right? He brings them all the way to the land of Canaan and he says, okay, this is where we make it a reality. All you have to do is trust me. But the people are like, yeah, about that trust thing. And over and over again, what we see in the book of Judges is that the people do not trust God. And because they want to do things their own way instead of trusting God, they fall into peril over and over. They don't trust God enough to go into the promised land. And as a result, they lose out on that inheritance. They don't want to trust God enough to go into battles his own way. And so they face defeat and they're unable to drive out the unhealthy pagan influences that reside in the land. They don't want to trust God enough to stay away from marrying people who have pagan beliefs, and as a result, they end up accepting these pagan beliefs and growing farther and farther away from their Creator and Savior. And now we find ourselves in a situation where God is no longer on Team Israel. Judges 2 verses 11 through 15 tell us, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of the surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. And here in verses 16 through 23 is essentially the Spark Notes version of the entire book. This is the whole idea summed up right here. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he said, because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations 
that Joshua left when he died. In order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. And thus we find Israel trapped in this cycle of sin. Now, what is this cycle of sin? I think it can be encapsulated by a quote that is often attributed to Albert Einstein, but almost certainly was not spoken by him. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So at this point in the story, Israel has essentially gone insane, right? They keep calling on God when they hit rock bottom and God in his infinite mercy hears their cry. He raises up a leader to come and bring them out of captivity, to come and give them freedom again. And then once they have that freedom and once that new leader passes on, they just go back to doing the same old stuff. They hit rock bottom again and the whole cycle starts over again. Now next week I'll be focusing on these positive stories. We all like to remember these heroes of the book of Judges that we all know and love, right? Deborah, Gideon, Samson, among others. These are wonderful triumphant stories for God's people. And we're going to focus on those lights in a dark place in the next message. But in order to truly get the book of Judges, we have to understand the full context, which is this, that this book is not about victory. It contains victory. But this is not a victorious book. It is about the utter failure that comes from trying to achieve victory without God. And that can be summed up in a recurring statement that we find over and over throughout the book of Judges. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Okay, so folks, this is an introduction to the book of Judges. This sermon is just uh, opening the door and trying to figure out what's going on here, right? And I want to encourage you to go ahead and do the studying for yourself, right? Go to wisensda.org slash judges and, and read uh, through the reading guide for yourself because I want you to experience uh, what scripture actually says in this story. I want you to encounter it for yourself, wrestle uh, with it for yourself, and come to your own conclusions as well. But what I hope to do today is to kind of prime your mind and set the tone for your reading as you go throughout this, right? Um, because this is a confusing book. A lot of people look at it and they get to the end of the book and they go, okay, why was that there? Uh, just a bunch of nonsense and, and, and tragedy, honestly. And I think maybe one of the best explanations for why a book like this might be included in scripture is found uh, in a quote from good old Auntie Ellen White herself. In Life Sketches, page 196, she says, We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. It's for this reason that I think the book of Judges is incredibly important for the times that we're living in. Many of you have looked around this past year and thought, the world has gone insane. And friends, you'd be right, it has. But there's your connecting point, right? It hasn't just gone insane, it's been insane for a long time. Scripture comes alive when we realize that we're not living in a separate story than these Hebrews are in the book of Judges. It's the same story, the same cycle of sin that we're dealing with today. We're living in a world today, in a nation today that has rejected God. And as Christian a nation as America might seem to some, we have to ask the question, was it ever Christian? Was it ever close to God? Was Israel? God's own people, were they ever actually close to God? Well, there might have been a time when things were better for the world, for America, for Israel, but in all honesty, friends, we can only succeed as individuals, as churches, as a nation, as a world, to the degree that we bring the Lord into battle with us. But all too often, Jesus takes a back seat. Our faith takes a back seat, while we decide we're gonna do things the way that we wanna do them instead. My challenge to you through the next couple of months and as we go forward into the year 2021 is this. Don't do things your way. Do things his way. Run to Jesus, not away from him. Because friends, we can literally move mountains. We can heal broken communities. We can ultimately 
see the land that the Lord has promised us, and he is promising us a new heaven and a new earth today. But we can't do it our way. We have to go to the Lord for help. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says it the best. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I want to encourage you to tuck that verse away in your heart uh, as we study this book over the next couple of months. The world operates just like Israel in the book of Judges, doing what is right in their own eyes. May we, as followers of God, operate differently. And may we respond like Joshua, that as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to say thank you for introducing us into this book of Judges. Lord, too often we lean on our own understanding, and I pray that you help us with that as we go throughout this series the next couple of months. Just be in our hearts. Help us to instead uh, lean on your ways instead of our understanding. Lord, help us to learn from this book, to learn from the history of, of failure in a relationship with God, and instead bring out of it a, a new faith that says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Thank you for that message today, Father, and I pray that you would continue to be with us throughout this year. Blessings on this year and continue to be with those watching this video, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.